John, thank you very much for inviting me to, to, to give this third annual uh, SAP lecture in, in memory of, of Helen Lester. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm very honored to follow in the footsteps of Carolyn Chu Graham, who I can see taking my picture over there, and Debbie Sharp, who I saw earlier on. Debbie, if you're still here, thank you for that. Uh, yes, lovely. Um, and I'm delighted to be speaking to you all here in Dublin, because this is where I was born and spent my childhood. And uh, just this morning, I was back in Stevens Green, which is just by our hotel, where, where my, actually my earliest memory as a child is, is feeding the ducks there and uh, making sure that they ate the bread and didn't eat my fingers. And I'm also delighted I'm one of the lucky people. I've got an Irish passport. <laughs> So I can, uh, I can stay in Europe while the rest of you are dragged off into the middle of the Atlantic by the Brexiteers. But Helen, as, 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 as Joanne was reminding us, what, what a remarkable woman. Um, a leading advocate for academic primary care through a secretary and chair of SAPC, as we've just heard, and through her senior positions in Manchester and in Birmingham. And, and with the RCGP. Um, a skilled and influential negotiator with the Department of Health over the Quality and Outcomes Framework. Um, she was a devoted wife and mother, as I, I, I discovered when we were at a meeting in Cancun a few years ago, and, and she announced she was staying for less than 24 hours because she had to go back because one of her children was in, a, was in a school play. But for me, most importantly, she, she was a dedicated GP in, in inner city Birmingham. Uh, with a career-long commitment to addressing health inequalities and improving the lives of marginalised people, particularly those with severe mental illness. And as, as Joanne has, has just mentioned, in her magnificent 2012 James McKenzie lecture, Helen directly challenged the persisting stigma of mental illness, calling us all to change from being bothered by to bothering about Billy, an alienated, homeless human being living with, with psychosis. She talked passionately about her drop-in medical service for the homeless of Birmingham, where she heard stories of unemployment, divorce, childhood traumas, teenage breakdowns, and how she was left with an unshakable impression that psychosis was something that primary care could and should engage with, and if she had anything to do with it, and by goodness me she did, would engage with. So that Helen demonstrated in this lecture and in her life's work two themes that to me are fundamental to medicine in general and to uh, primary mental health care in particular. Acknowledging suffering and offering hope. And th these are the themes that I wish to discuss in her memory this evening. So with the help of, of Darren from Liverpool, Virgil from Rome, uh, various Irish cultural icons and a, a rather motley crew of primary care academics. Uh, I'm going to explore the curious ambivalence we have with regard to acknowledging suffering, how despite our best intentions we often find it hard to really listen to our patients' distress, and I will suggest some things that might help us to listen better. I will then discuss how we can offer hope to patients in distress through compassion, by being thoughtfully positive from the discovery and application of new knowledge and perhaps by changing the ways in which we think about ourselves and our patients. But the first thing we need to do is to listen. In the words of the British psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion, we should be listening without memory or desire. When we listen with memory, we're intent on making the speaker part of an old agenda, and when we listen with desire, we're intent on making them part of a new one. But to listen purely, to just listen, is the most valuable thing. But it's also the most difficult thing. I don't know about you, but I often find it exhausting and debilitating to give my full attention to the suffering of others. That suffering may be expressed in poetic form, as composed here in Dublin, actually, by Gerard Manley Hopkins, who is poet, priest, and professor of Greek literature at University College. Uh, no worst, there is none. P 
pitched past pitch of grief, more pangs will schooled at four pangs, wilder ring. Oh, the mind, mind has mountains, cliffs of fall, frightful, sheer, no man fathomed. Or in the paintings of uh, Francis Bacon, currently on exhibition in Tate Liverpool, portraying his subjects enclosed in the wretched glass capsule of the human individual. Or in the expression of collective suffering, when things fall apart, the centre cannot hold and mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Uh, we're conscious of that very much today with the, um, the Chilcot report and the, the um, uh, disasters of uh, British foreign policy in Iraq, but also more recently um, the um, turmoil and the consequences of that in Syria and Libya and perhaps, I fear, um, uh, potential disintegrations of both the, the UK and um, the European Union. Or more at home, uh, the bristling, frustrating anguish of 19-year-old Darren piercings through his lips, nose and eyebrows, scarring up both arms, who tells me about parental separation, fostering and sexual abuse, bullying in school, and how booze keeps him from feeling too much but leads to fights with friends and nightclub doormen and even the police. His only comfort, he tells me, is beating the hell out of his drum kit in the middle of the night, and he's, he doesn't think he'll live much longer, and I'm, uh, I fear he may be right. We often, consciously or otherwise, find ways to protect ourselves, to distance ourselves from the full emotional impact of what our patients are trying to tell us. Avidomy just doesn't want to hear what Darren's telling me. It's too raw, it's too real, it's, it's too painful. Ian McWinney, one of the great inspirations of modern general practice, argues that we're tempted to shy away from suffering because we're driven by our unexamined, egocentric emotions. And it's this lack of openness in the face of suffering which closes off compassion and stops us from being healers. And I've been reflecting on some of the ways in which we shy away from suffering. I'm sure you will think of others as well. Um, first of all, we may distance ourselves by normalizing the problems that the patient presents dismissing them, offering rudimentary reassurance, or providing simplistic explanations unrelated to their concerns. Or we, we may reach for a diagnosis as a form of emotional safety blanket, trying to turn human suffering unbearable to the doctor into a disease which is something treatable and therefore bearable. Making the diagnosis of depression, for an example, is a particularly attractive option for controlling our uncertainty in the consulting room as it carries with it the ready-made options of a prescription of our favoured antidepressant, or at least in the UK, of a referral for psychological therapy. I think this goes a long way to explain why GPs tend to over-diagnose and over-treat depression. We're 50% more likely to diagnose depression when it's not present than to identify a case correctly or miss a case when it is present. And in a US study, only 38% of adults with depression diagnosed by a family doctor actually met standard diagnostic criteria. Nevertheless, most were prescribed mood-altering medication. And we create even more distance when we introduce the diagnosis of depression into cross-cultural consultations. The cross-cultural reorder study, which involved interviews with GPs and people of Vietnamese and East Timorese origin in Melbourne, posed a central dilemma. How to integrate experiences grounded in one social context within the matrices provided by another? We, that's including Jane and uh, Carl and a number of other people who are here, we, we identified a tremendous collision between migrants whose experience was framed by patterns of alienation and traumatized self-identity, and GPs who interpreted their distress as technical problems of practice. 
Migrants saw their suffering as related to family disintegration, marital breakdown, intergenerational conflict, immigration, and cultural distance. Oh, my first impression was that it was so cold. It was cold. From Malaysia, where it was hot, we had on only light clothing, so it was terribly cold. It was on a Saturday we arrived. There was no one in the city. I thought, how come there were no people in this country? And the streets were deserted, and I thought, now I was in another country, and I didn't know English. I didn't know how I would start a new life, and that was my continuing worry. But faced with such communal and structural accounts of suffering, GPs opted, opted to defend and draw on an individualized notion of depression in performing their work and accounting for the distress being presented to them. This is one GP. I think, I think most people understand sadness, and quite a lot of people understand depression as a condition that can require treatment, but in some cultures, they just don't understand it as a condition that requires treatment. Now, in this context, the diagnosis of depression was not a clinical entity, but it was a mechanism of decoupling, replacing loss with illness. It individualized previously social problems, and in doing so, the GPs were effectively distancing themselves from the reality of the suffering being presented. Or it may be that sometimes we simply can't understand what our patients are experiencing. A participant in one of Helen's studies puts it like this. The things, the emotions, the feelings that we as people suffering from mental distress go through simply aren't experienced by people in good health. And therefore, trying to get across to somebody who hasn't ever felt like, you know, the sort of Damocles hanging around your neck for no apparently good reason, you know, you can't do it. It's like trying to explain colours to a blind person. Of course, it's, it's not simply a matter of our personal shortcomings. The systems within which we operate may also negate our openness to suffering. Communication training in general practice emphasizes cognitive aspects of our patients' experiences, their ideas, their concerns, and their expectations. But this focus on what patients think about their problems can lead us into a false sense that we've covered all the bases of person-centered care because it neglects the crucial question of what they might be feeling. And being open to suffering is getting harder all the time in the face of huge changes in the delivery of primary care, with annual consultation rates rising, continuity of care and face-to-face -face contact declining, an increasing emphasis on standardized protocol-driven care, the relentless hunt for cough points, and the distracting omnipresence of the computer in the consulting room. But nevertheless, we can do better. Ronald Epstein recommends that we turn towards suffering, that we actively seek to recognize it, become curious about the patient's experience, and intentionally become more present and engaged. Now, it's, it's not simply a question of deciding to do this. If it's, if it's in our intention, then we probably need to be enabled. Mentors, Peer support and supervision are all important, as anyone who's been involved with a, a Balint group can testify. And for me, what, what helps these days are um, uh, daily meditations, uh, weekly park runs, and um, knowing that I'm able to discuss knotty problems with my wise wife, Sue. But formal training is also beneficial. Ron's group in Rochester, New York, found that an educational program in mindful communication increased empathy and patient-centered care and also reduced burnout. And family physicians who took part in that reported enhanced ability to listen deeply to their patients' concerns and to develop their own adaptive reserves. Uh, Helen Rice and colleagues trialed empathy training modules in postgraduate medical education, and they found significant impact on empathy scores as rated by patients and a recent Dutch pilot study of mindfulness-based stress reduction for GPs found positive effects on dedication, mindfulness, and compassion. Now, 
with profound apologies to all existentialists and any Evertonians in the audience, I'm going to move on to my second theme and I'm going to talk a while about hope. Bearing witness to suffering, giving our patients a sense of being understood and accepted is the first essential step towards hope. And this, this is where Virgil comes in. in. In the first book of the Aeneid, we find Aeneas as a refugee driven far from home by the vicious ravages of the Trojan War. He's in Carthage, gazing at a mural in a temple which depicts battles of the Trojan War and the deaths of many of his friends and countrymen. And he's moved to tears and he offers this rousing tribute to his fallen comrades. Now, those of you whose Latin's a bit rusty, you don't need to worry. Uh, it, it's just three words here, sunt lacrimae rerum, that, that, that I want to concentrate on. Uh, with, with the help of uh, my grade two Latin O level, and, and a, a very scholarly exegesis in Wikipedia, I, I propose that this phrase brings us to the heart of the link between suffering and hope. Rerum is the genitive of res, things, and importantly in Latin can be understood in both objective and subjective terms. So this phrase has been translated as either there are tears for things, or else there are tears of things. So the first objective version indicates the burdens we have to bear, the frailty of human existence, the shit life syndrome that so many patients experience. But the second subjective version indicates that things feel sorrow for our suffering, that in, in some sense the universe feels our pain. But of course, it isn't one or the other, it's both. Virgil is fully aware of the ambiguity and wishes us to understand both meanings at the same time. And so, so does Seamus Heaney, who translates the phrase as, there are tears at the heart of things. And this is its richness and power in the consultation. Uh, at that moment when I experience and express compassion for the suffering of the person in the room with me, both senses of sunt lacrimae librarum are in play simultaneously. My patient can express pain, distress and suffering, knowing that from me he finds understanding, compassion and safety. And my consulting room has become momentarily a sanctuary. Sometimes bearing witness to a patient's suffering in the, in the face of overwhelming life experiences and difficulties may be all that's possible or necessary. Listening to Darren, behind his angry ranting, I, I hear a lost, lonely, frightened little boy, and I, I want to give him a big hug and bring him home with me, but I content myself with a friendly smile and a warm handshake and an agreement to meet again soon. And there's emerging evidence of the beneficial effects of clinical compassion in primary care across a range of conditions. Stuart Mercer's group, Stuart was talking this morning about this, have shown that patients' perceptions of their GP's empathy are key to enablement, which in turn leads to improvement in symptom severity and related well-being. A Dutch observational study found that antidepressant medication was associated with better depression outcomes, but only when provided by supportive and empathic GPs. And in Italy, diabetic patients of GPs with high empathy scores had significantly lower rates of acute metabolic complications than patients of GPs with moderate and low empathy scores. But for most patients, our acknowledgement of their suffering is just the first step on the way out of the dark woods in which they find themselves. And I want now to consider the relevance of being positive. We can broadly accept, I think, that if a doctor expresses hope and optimism, 
and takes a positive approach to the problem the patient presents, then more therapeutic benefit is likely to derive than if the doctor expresses doubt and uncertainty. But there are several caveats here. Paul Little and colleagues have shown us that if optimism is expressed too early in the consultation, before the patient has had adequate opportunity to tell his story, this may be perceived as evidence of a lack of empathy and understanding. And our esteemed colleague Sinead O'Connor agrees with that. And then there are at least four ways in which the doctor might propose a positive approach. The doctor may indicate that she's an expert in the problem and she can solve it for the patient. Or she may indicate that doctor and patient could successfully work on the problem together. Or the patient has the resources to manage it herself. Or the symptoms will resolve spontaneously without the need for any intervention. Uh, these are all perfectly legitimate versions of a positive approach. And they all convey hope and optimism. But they're also very different in their orientation. And in particular, they vary in the extent to which they're positive about the outcome of the condition, prognostic confidence, or positive about the outcome of treatment, therapeutic confidence. And it's not clear whether any one of these differing positive approaches is more therapeutic than any other, whether any benefits are contextual, or whether it's the fact of being positive, regardless of content or direction of positivity, that's intrinsically therapeutic. And then, it's likely that the benefit or disbenefit of a given approach is affected by the patient's understanding of the nature of his problem. For example, a doctor-focused approach might be more helpful for someone with a disease-based understanding of their problem, while a self-care or time-focused approach might be more helpful for someone who sees himself as having problems with life circumstances. But in any event, I think we can safely assume that shaping the patient's story in a more hopeful direction is likely to be valuable. Talking with Darren, I aim to build on his strengths, his, his obvious intelligence and his drumming skills. And we can see the hopeful shaping in, in this consultation between a, a North London GP and a patient with muscular dystrophy. It starts off, the patient says, it's just quite painful and tiring and depressing. Yeah, yeah, says the doctor. And I've been feeling really cold since I came back and I just can't seem to get warm, so it's, it's very, very depressing, I'm sorry. And the doctor says, it's, it's not easy to put up with this, is it? You're obviously someone you like to keep very active and getting around the place and doing what you want to do. I just don't want it to be on top of me. And it feels like it's on top of me. We've got to reverse that, haven't we, says the doctor. We can't get rid of the dystrophy, but you can be on top of it, rather than the other way around. Rather than, rather than the other way around, somehow. Now, th this is a lovely example of sensitive, patient-centered optimism. But it, it's not sufficient in itself, and it, and it leads us on, because it, it, it begs the important question, how do we reverse the problem, whatever that problem might be, so that the patient can be on top of it? And this, this leads us on to the third element in our offer of hope, that it's got to be based on the best available evidence. And as primary care academics, we're in a unique position to generate and apply evidence about effective primary mental health care. And between us, I think we've done a remarkably good job of doing exactly that over the past couple of decades. And I'm, I'm, I've selected uh, five examples of research that Helen and I, and actually many of you in this room, uh, have contributed to. Uh, but incidentally, before I get to that, I, 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 I should say I think of, of Helen's research uh, in the present tense rather than in the past. Uh, th thanks to the affection and esteem w w in which she's held by her uh, co-investigators, she, she continues to be a named author on a series of high-quality uh, research outputs, actually to the extent that if, if posthumous um, submissions were allowed, she, she would do rather better than many of us in, uh, in REF 2020. Um, 
Well, anyway, here are, here are five hopeful things that we now know as a result of research that we've been involved with about, about primary mental health care. First of all, we've greatly increased our understanding of physical, psychological and social factors influencing the trajectory of mental health problems presenting in primary care. We can now use this knowledge to offer more accurate prognoses and tailor our interventions to meet patients' specific needs more effectively. So for Darren, who, who I know is definitely in a high-risk group, I commit myself to seeing him regularly, and I offer him the options of psychotropic medication and referral to our local community mental health team. And I'm looking forward to the results of Jane Gunn's RCT of Target D, um, a clinical prediction tool which stratifies patients for targeted depression care, and there's a presentation about that on, um, on Friday morning. We now have a much clearer idea of how GPs can communicate therapeutically with patients presenting with unexplained physical symptoms, following their cues and requests for explanation and support, and providing explanations that are tangible, exculpating and involving. We know that people with severe and enduring mental illness have reduced life expectancy due mainly to their increased risk of physical illnesses and that primary care has a pivotal role to play in redressing this major health inequality and we now have in the Leicester Toolkit an invaluable resource to promote cardiometabolic health for patients with psychosis. We now know that active collaboration between primary and secondary care improves access to interventions for untreated psychosis and improves outcomes for depression. And Richard Bing's Partners 2 trial, which is ongoing at the moment, will tell us more about how collaborative care can improve outcomes in psychosis. We know that the success of strategies to increase equity of access to primary mental health care for marginalised groups, including older people, members of black and minority ethnic communities, asylum seekers and refugees, is critically dependent on mutual engagement between primary care and community stakeholders. And we now know from the AMP programme that several of us were involved with, Carolyn and myself and others, and, and from Anne McFarlane's Restore project, what strategies are likely to enable this mutual engagement to take place. Of course, there's more evidence-based hopefulness that we still need to generate. Although the Leicester Toolkit and COF are enabling equality of access to chronic disease monitoring, we know from a paper in last month's BJGP and indeed a presentation this afternoon, that there remains the challenge of achieving equity of treatment for people with uh, psychosis or severe and enduring mental illness in primary care. Uh, and so the, the challenge still remains of, of translating the access into something that will actually improve uh, life, um, life expectancy for this group. We know from Tony Kendrick's THREAD trial the treatment with an SSRI plus supportive care is more effective than supportive care alone for people with mild to moderate depression in primary care. But we don't know how much of that difference is due to placebo or contextual effects. And we're hoping that the, the currently running placebo-controlled PANDA trial will provide an answer to that essential question. We also need to find out how people can come off antidepressants when they no longer need them, and, and Tony's forthcoming REDUCE programme will help us to do that. And then there's evidence from studies in Southampton and Melbourne of improved outcomes amongst patients who take an active approach to managing their own mental health problems, holding illness beliefs which emphasise the benefits of exercise or activity, or deploying strategies to expand their inner resources. Now, these associations are intriguing and they deserve further investigation. My fourth and final ingredient for an effective offer of hope is more speculative. It concerns 
weather and how we think of patients as persons. You, you may remember John Skelton and Richard Hobbs' brilliant analysis of the metaphors used by GPs in routine consultations. They, they showed how we tend to use mechanical metaphors to explain diseases, how we consider patients' problems as puzzles and cast GPs in the roles of problem solvers and controllers of disease. And when talking about psychological unease, they found that GPs tend to use words based on physical metaphors of tension and relaxation, speaking about problems to do with nerves and the nervous system and about ways in which medication may affect a finely balanced system. But there's a fundamental flaw with that perspective. It puts the onus on doctors to achieve change while undermining patients' sense of enablement. It's actually a recipe for burnout and failure. And it contradicts our stated intentions of promoting patient self-management, joint decision-making, and shared mind. It squeezes both doctor and patient into a suffocating conceptual cul-de-sac. What would be the impact if we change the ways in which we think about ourselves and our patients? If we generate a new set of metaphors dynamic and temporal rather than passive and deterministic, offering concepts of personhood and the self which contain possibilities of hope, action and purpose. If I see Darren not as an unemployable borderline personality disorder but as a critically creative musician. There are some fascinating ideas emerging about all this. Um, in, in my own book, Beyond Depression, I sketch out a theory of persons leading their lives based on concepts of coherence and engagement. Joanne proposes an understanding of creative capacity based on sense-making, anchors, partnership, and balance. Deborah, Sw Deborah Swinglehurst is considering how the self may be performed and constructed through relationships with other human beings and it interacts with interactions with material artifacts and technologies. Uh, I hope some of you will join us on, on Friday morning when we're exploring the implications of these ideas in our, in our workshop uh, on the self. So... In this lecture, I've ex examined the two fundamental concepts of suffering and hope. I've suggested some reasons why we find it difficult to acknowledge suffering and some ways of doing so more readily. I've argued that our offer of hope starts with that acknowledgement, but also needs a thoughtfully positive outlook, a strong evidence base, and perhaps a revision of our notions of the self. Uh, I hope Helen would approve. Some last thoughts. An update on Darren. He's been coming to see me every few weeks, actually, for several years now. He's still alive. He still mostly rants, and I still mostly listen, but there's less booze and, and fewer fights in his life. He's got a girlfriend and a dog, and his drumming skills are found outlet in, in two local bands, and one of them actually has the possibility of a recording contract. So we're actually, we're both beginning to feel more hopeful. And as well as taking the best possible care of our patients, we also need to take good care of ourselves, whatever we, we may consider those selves to be. Whether it's in the midst of a frantic Friday afternoon surgery or a, a high profile research project where our recruitment rates are way behind target, a demand from the dean to pack even more students into an already frantic teaching program, or an awareness of our own frailty and mortality in the face of a tra traumatic accident or, or life-threatening disease. We do well to recognize our own suffering and give ourselves the freedom to hope. And I'm going to leave you with these words from um, Irish poet, philosopher, priest, Celtic mystic, uh, John O'Donoghue. On the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. 
And when your eyes freeze behind the grey window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colours, indigo, red, green and azure blue, come to awaken in you a meadow of delight. And so, may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. Thank you.